I was raised among the frozen chosen, but that, that warrants a reaction, don't you think? <laughs> Good words. Thank you, orchestra, uh, for supporting all of this and in, in fleshing, literally in fleshing our worship together. Thank you. And again, choir, thank you. Good, lovely and good words this morning. A few weeks ago, I was looking at my calendars, as we all do, and uh, these upcoming weeks are just going to be busy, uh, Saturday and Sunday commitments, along with commitments during the week, and, and uh, found out that, that uh, Friday and Saturday this past weekend, I was able to kind of carve some time out to, to be away. Uh, by the way, for those of y'all still, uh, still full-time employed, we all need to remind ourselves nothing falls apart when we're gone. It may get messy, but they, they keep functioning just fine without us. But anyway, I said all of, uh, say all of that as a setup to just simply say we needed to find some time to go visit my youngest son, uh, my daughter-in-law, and more importantly, my six-month-old grandson who lived 400 miles away. So it's a quick trip Friday and uh, come back on Saturday to spend some time with them and with my grandson and uh, being delighted. And uh, though I'm, I'm getting too old for this, I'm never too old for the fact that uh, You'll do what you got to do to be with those whom you love. So I thank you for doing what you need to do to be here today because that's important. Sometimes you get out of bed and you just don't feel like it. I get it. Bodies don't cooperate. Minds don't always come together as they should. But you're here and I'm here and we're here. And because we are here, we give thanks to God who's joined us and has promised that whenever two or more are gathered, their God will be with us. Today we wrap up a three-part series on the prodigal narrative, that story in Luke chapter 15. We've looked at the perspective of the prodigal whom the story is named after, that son who took it all and squandered it all and came back home penitent to the father. We also looked last week from the perspective of the elder brother. Uh, uh, I suspect that many of us more closely align with the good son who did everything right and no one was throwing him a party. And today we're going to just focus now on the loving father. So I'll read selection from Luke chapter 15. Follow along in your Bibles or on the screen beginning with verse 11. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the wealth that will belong to me. So he divided his assets between them. And a few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant region. And there he squandered his wealth in dissolute living. And then we'll skip ahead to verse 22. The father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get that fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. Verse 28, then he became angry. This is the brother now. Became angry and refused to go into the party, and his father came out and began to plead with him. And then the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. These are God's words. They are faithful and can be trusted. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, we move from amazement to amazement, grace, forgiveness, pursuant love. And so we gather now in this time of our worship and pray that minds be opened, that we may think critically with the mind of Christ, that hearts be compassionate, that we may love with the mercy of Christ, and that our lives may be steadfast, that we serve in the very name of Christ. For this is our prayer, and we offer it in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, I, I just broke a rule uh, in, in uh, Scripture reading. I just went right through that whole passage, right? I, I'm making some assumptions here this morning. I'm assuming that even if this is your first time with us today, that 
Most of us are very familiar with this story, and certainly if you've been enduring this sermon series for the last couple of weeks, you've heard this story over and over again. We spend a lot of time and attention focusing on what we call the prodigal son, the son who lived foolishly and wastefully and regrettably. But I need to point out as we wrap this three-part series up that this story is not about the reckless son. It isn't about the prodigal at all. Yet we've named the story after him, the prodigal son, and we know exactly how this story goes. But I want you to pay attention to how Jesus begins telling this story. And you find it in verse 11, and I quote, There once was a man who had two sons. There once was a man who had two sons. The point of the story really isn't about the prodigal son or the resentful brother, though I think in good storytelling fashion we should pay some attention to it. But Jesus begins the story by opening up with, there once was a man and he had two sons. Now, verse 12, the tension is set. As we know, the son asked for his share of the inheritance. The request was both disrespectful and insulting. If you're looking at a Greek translation, it literally reads, the father divided his life with him. The Greek word there is bios, from which we use the word life. He divided his bios, his life between them. Now, for families here today where division has defined you, you can empathize with the story's thickening plot here where relationships are dead and and the, the patriarch divides his life over the children. Indeed, this is the kind of the story of the ages for any strange relationship. For a friend, a, a colleague, or even a church member, this story makes sense. It's also a story for all of us who in one way or another have Serve the role as the prodigal, the homelessness from God here. It's like the college student who leaves for home and in doing so leaves their faith behind them. It's the executive who's climbed the corporate ladder of success and somewhere along the line God gets left behind. It's the hurting adult child who has stood beside the bedside of the suffering parent and feels alone and cut off and distant. It's not hard to be a prodigal when you begin to think about it. Prodigals even go to church and serve on committees and are highly respected leaders. But like I said, the focus is not on the waywardness, but on the Father's generous love. That really is the point of the story There's a few things I just want to leave with us this morning as we wrap up this trilogy of messages. This is the story of of the Father's forgiveness that focuses on seeking and not losing. Now, on the outset, that may seem obvious enough. Uh, It's kind of straightforward. But I'm not sure we always get that. Again, this is a story we've heard so much, like all good stories, that there's a few details we quit paying attention to because we focus on other details here. This entire story is actually part of a larger narrative of being lost and being found. Now, I get it. For some of you, the very image of father's problematic. Maybe you've had a problematic or fractured relationship with a father, and every time I say father, you wince a little bit because it's hard to identify. I get that. I understand that. Jesus begins telling these stories, though, at the very beginning of Luke 15 by saying, well, let me tell you what lost and found looks like. It's sort of like a shepherd who notices there's a sheep missing. It's sort of like a woman who notices that there's a coin missing. It's sort of like a father who's got not just one, but two sons missing. You see, this point of the story here is not about losing, but about seeking. Not about what was lost, 
but celebrating what is found here. Chapter 15 begins by, or rather Jesus begins telling these stories because the religious community has lost their way. Don't take it personal. Well, no, wait a minute. We really should take it personal. The Pharisees and the scribes, the good church-going folks have gotten all upset because their priorities have gotten out of line. And Jesus says, well, let me tell you what God's love is like. And so he starts winding out these stories of, of sheep and, and coins and children. They were grumbling against Jesus because he's associating with the wrong kind of people. May it be said of First Baptist Roswell that every one of us gets caught in places where we don't belong and we, where, we, where we shouldn't hang out and all because we dare to believe that maybe, maybe God's hanging out there too. Because you see, God is not in the losing business, but in the finding business. It's a lost and found kind of tale. I should have asked Logan about this or, or Jessica or Doyle or, or Robert or somebody, but I'm just guessing, does, does this church have a lost and found? I, I can't imagine you not having one. Every church has a lost and found. The last church I served as a pastor, for 10 years I served this church as a pastor, and every time I left my Bible behind on the pulpit, the Bible would end up in the lost and found. Uh, I mean, there's a giveaway there. It's on the pulpit. It has my name in it, but it got to the lost and found, and I'd have to go find. I'm not exaggerating at all on this story. Most churches have a lost and found section, box, or somewhere. And I, I'm just guessing, if I were to look over this church's lost and found, there would be some artifacts left behind that have been there a while. You know, the reading glasses, the costume jewelry, or, or, or sometimes Bibles, to be really honest with you. Uh, and what's interesting is that much of the merchandise left behind or forgotten about in the lost and found is because they're items that aren't that really precious. They're just not that important. And so they're sort of given up for lost. That can happen in church too, you know. People sort of go missing, and next thing you know, they're not missed. A few years ago, I read a poignant novel, Gilead. I highly recommend that, uh, not only the author, but those novels that she has spun out. In it, the, one of the characters returns from fighting in the Civil War and wounded and blinded in their right eye, and the, the locals would comment to him about how tragic it was that he lost his eye, and his reply was simple. I'd like to think that I've returned with one good eye. I'm not suggesting that something pithy like keep on the sunny side, but if forgiveness focuses on what, of calculating what one has lost, you know, lost love or lost opportunity or lost reputation or lost trust and so on, we'll become bitter. Now, I did not say we are in danger of becoming bitter that we might be better or that some will be better when we focus on what we have lost, we will be bitter. The Pharisees in this story, they, they didn't care about what was found. It was enough to criticize the wayward and the lost. But the father did not focus on what was lost here. The focus wasn't on lost wealth or lost opportunities or lost reputation. I mean, think for a moment how he must have felt. This is embarrassing, right? Does it make its way into this narrative? But rather because this son of his, as re found, recorded in verse 32, was found. First Baptist Roswell is in the search and rescue kind of business. We are to be a finding church. It's also inter interesting to me here that in this story, the father's uh, forgiveness the father's love was in its own way kind of prodigal. Remember how a couple of weeks, and I alluded to this, that the word prodigal, it means reckless, wasteful, extravagant, not in the good kind of way. And we attribute that to the son that takes his share of the inheritance and squanders it all. But if you ask me, this story is really about the prodigal father here. He's the one that's being reckless, 
He's the one that's being extravagant. He's the one that's being wasteful. Ah, yes. And I think if the father were standing here today, he might agree with that interpretation. Uh, the, 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 the verse 20, but, but while he was still far off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion, and he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. What a shameful act for a first century Middle Easterner to do, to actually the elder one go out and do the running and the chasing. But the father said to the slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. That's how you treat royalty. And get the fatted calf and kill it, let us eat. And let us celebrate. The, the loving father, I think, certainly earns his title as loving here. In effect, you see, he's lost two sons. He lost his youngest son to recklessness and carelessness. And he, and he lost his oldest son, too, to bitterness and blame. And the father loves and forgives them. He does so not according to what they have deserved or what they have earned. In fact, there's no repentance in this story. Let me say that clearly. There's no repentance in this story. Oh, sure, the youngest son is penitent, but he's never given the chance. The father cuts him off. Do you remember how the story goes? The son practices his speech in the pig pen. And then when he shows up to his dad, he starts going through the speech. Dad, I've sinned against God and I've sinned against, you know, all of these. And the father cuts him off. I don't want to hear it. The father cuts him off mid-sentence and declares a party for this one who is lost and now has found this one who is dead and now lives. He loves both his sons, the prodigal one and the sullen one, because that's who he, hit, that's who he is, not who they are. And thanks be to God that you, are, you and I are loved with that same kind of love. Not because of who we are or what we have done or what we have not done, but because of who God is. Most of us remember the name Timothy McVeigh. Well, most of us of a certain age remember the name Timothy McVeigh was guilty of one of the most horrific uh, crimes, domestic crimes in our country, and uh, the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City in 1995. And uh, the act of violence took the lives of 168 persons, including uh, 19 children, um, whom McVeigh referred to as collateral damage. I don't want to hold him up as like the epitome of uh, a fallen individual, but rather how touched I was about his father pleading for his son's life. Not because he was excusing his son, but because that's what a father does. He loved him. That's what dads do, at least healthy dads do. Now let's bring all this home for just a moment. Some of you are experiencing some very, very real pain of what it means to live in a divided family. And and I mean that literally. Maybe you come out of that family environment where you don't know that kind of love, that kind of surrounding. I also mean that figuratively. Some of you are in relationships in which things are just not right and good. You've lost something precious to you. My word to you is now is the time to be found. Now is the time to practice that kind of prodigal love here, a love that is given not because it is asked for or because it is deserved, a love that is not measured or conditional. Prodigal love, you see, is foolish and extravagant. It cannot be added up. Critics might even describe it as wasteful, but that's the kind of love that Jesus is describing in this story. It's the kind of love that God gives to us. About forgiveness, we're like the boy in the pig pen or the brother standing outside in the yard while the rest of the family celebrates. We are outside looking in. Can't you just see the Father welcoming us home again when we are together again? Now I want to wrap this all up by just simply saying that the Father's forgiveness was willing to go the very distance it needed to go, 
The story has nothing to do with consequences or retributive justice. It's simply a picture of God. The giving and grace-filled picture of God who loves, who welcomes, who receives us back time and time and time again. God is the one that is ready to throw that party to celebrate when we are dead to ourselves and others. Jesus paints this picture of a father searching and waiting and waiting and waiting because that's what God's love is like for all of us. Waiting while we work through our low self-esteem. Waiting while we seethe with resentment. Waiting while we begrudge the neighbor. God waits with a love that will go the distance that we have set between ourselves and God. And when we distance ourselves from others, we're only distancing ourselves from God. And there's no distance too great for God to reach through the chasm into our lives. A month or so ago, I was being introduced. Um, I was speaking somewhere, and I don't, I don't remember where, but whoever was introducing me said, um, said something to the effect of, and, and Greg likes to run. And they went on with some other things. And so I got up to the, 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 the lectern, and I said, well, I need to kind of correct the introduction there. You said, Greg likes to run. I do run. I run a lot, I think. I run because it's good, good for you. Uh, I, I run because it's good for stress relief. Uh, I, I don't like running. I don't know anybody who likes running. <laughs> Have you ever seen a jogger smile? I mean, think of it. <laughs> but I do like to keep up with running stories. And years ago, I read this story about a man named Dick Hoyt. Several videos out there, YouTube videos, about he and his son, Rick Hoyt. And then I read this article, I don't know, about 10 years ago in Sports Illustrated that was kind of celebrating Dick Hoyt's life. So Dick has a son named Rick who was born with cerebral palsy, quadriplegic, nonverbal, or at least in terms of being able to articulate words without the assistance of a computer. His then 11-year-old son came home from school and kind of tapped out on the computer saying they're having a, a fun, a, a charitable race, 5K, which is like three miles, and uh, I'd love for you to do it, Dad, and push me in the wheelchair. And his dad said in the Sports Illustrated article, he described himself as kind of a porker, not really a runner, but, you know, his son asked, so you do what your son needs done. So he pushes his son in a wheelchair in this 5K race, finishes second from last, kind of humiliating, right? Except for this started something. And in the ensuing decades, Dick and his son Rick competed in over a thousand races, multiple competitions at the Boston Marathon, ran multiple triathlons. You know, that's where you're not only running the race, but you're also swimming. So he's pulling his son in a dinghy. Can you imagine being a 25-year-old athlete being passed by grandpa, pulling his son in a boat, and then cycling alongside in a retrofitted bicycle? So he ran these races and swam these races and cycled these races with his son with cerebral palsy, each one crossing the finish line. His son said, it's almost as if I didn't have a disability at all, that I felt like I was running that race. In fact, another little interesting wrinkle is in the midpoint of this racing career, the doctor said to Dick, you have a, a cardiovascular disease and your artery is 95% shut. We're going to need to do surgery. So they had to pause their competition. And the doctor said to him something curious. He said, you you know, if you'd not been running all these races, you'd have been dead 15 years ago. His son saved his life. But you know, the moral of the story is a pretty obvious one. There's no question what this father was going to do for his son. The length he was willing to go to. This is the story not about the prodigal son but about the prodigal father. 
In it, we have the very best of theology. That's who God is. But let me make a quick application as we prepare to sing our hymn of invitation. And because that is who God is, that is who we are to be as a church. We're the kind of church that focuses on seeking, not worrying about what we've lost. We're the kind of church that practices a reckless kind of love. We're the kind of church that will not grow weary. We'll go the distance. Let's pray together. Oh God, as we prepare now to respond to this time of worship together, we pray now that you strengthen us and guide us, give us the direction we need as we seek to respond to your holy movement. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you as we sing our hymn of response, 185, Jesus, what a friend we have in sinners. I'll be there to the right here of the aisle. If you have a decision to be made this morning, I want to invite you to come make that decision. It may mean to become a part of this congregation. It may mean that you've been one of those that's feeling as though you're lost and you're looking for that place to be home. It may mean that that relationship has never quite been fostered between a loving God because all you have seen is a God that could only count what you have not done well. However, you are responding. Let's stand together, let us sing together, and let us respond as the Lord so leads us.